modern science itself. And this is the, uh, the subject that has either the name cosmology or cosmogony, the idea of the origin of the universe itself. And uh, I think this is uh, one of the key meta questions. It raises one of the key meta questions that John Polkinghorne was talking about last night. Um, since this is a conference on science and theology, I won't actually read the, the screen here. I, I think it meant to say heck. But uh, the, idea, this, the idea of the, the cartoon is, of course, uh, really clear, which is that the, this question of where did it all come from is a perennial human question, one that is properly classified, I think, as metaphysical or ph philosophical. But it's also, interestingly, in the 20th century, become a scientific question. And I'm very interested in the questions that are at this point of intersection between and the philosophical or the metaphysical. And is perhaps the chief, uh, it's exhibit A in, in this uh, type of endeavor or this type of inquiry. So our, my lecture this morning is going to be on uh, we'll address the question of the origin of the universe and look at the new cosmology, the cosmology that has developed over the 20th century since about the 1920s, and uh, with an eye towards investigating the possible theistic implications of some of the discoveries that have been made in the 20th century. Now, to talk about the metaphysical implications of a scientific endeavor, um, is to do some philosophizing about science. And I'm going to get to that at the end. But I know that a number of uh, students, at least, have been strongly encouraged. Uh, can we say compelled to come? I don't um, know. And I know that uh, this is we have a mixture in the audience of people from uh, universities in the region and also people who have um, uh, a lay interest in these topics. In fact, this perennial question of where we all came from is something that we all uh, are interested in whether we're scientists or not. So one of the things, I'm going to do two things in this lecture. Uh, I'll start by giving a survey of the history of some of the key scientific discoveries in 20th century cosmology. And uh, I've got some uh, visual aids uh, to get this across. And uh, so this, the first part of the lecture will be very accessible. And the idea here is we want to, we want to let everyone in on the conversation regardless of background before we start to engage the, the larger philosophical issues. So the first part of the talk will be a history, a survey of scientific developments in modern cosmology. And the second will be um, shorter, but I will sketch out what I think to be some theistic implications of those discoveries and make um, a philosophical argument to that effect. So um, here we go. Um, wonderful quote here from uh, Alfred North Whitehead, 1926. He says, when we consider what religion is to mankind and what science is, uh, he says it's no exaggeration to say that the future course of history depends upon the decision of this generation as to the relationship between the two of them. Now, Whitehead spoke at a time in the early 1920s when it w had become widely perceived that there was a conflict between science and religion. Uh, the very model of the interaction that both John Polkinghorne and Peter Hodgson spoke against in the previous two talks. In the 1920s, uh, this was the perception of thinking people that, uh, that science, to the extent it had anything to say about larger metaphysical or philosophical questions, said things that were decidedly anti-theistic. And Whitehead, though not a traditional Orthodox Christian, he was more, uh, especially later, uh, a process theologian, uh, was very concerned about the impact of this conflict on Western, Western civilization. Because he knew what uh, Peter has just explained, which is that science and religion, uh, or that, that, that religion formed and helped give birth to science, and that the two had worked hand in hand through much of Western history. These were two important institutions in the West, and now they seem to be at loggerheads. He made some very prescient comments about what might happen um, in European countries that embraced a materialistic ideology, uh, and this is before World War II. Okay, now, 
why is Whitehead, why is he so concerned? Well, in part because he realizes that science had had this Christian heritage. And if you go back to um, the, the 17th century, you find that the early biologists believed um, along the lines that, that Peter was developing, that not, not only did they believe that the universe was open to inquiry, that it was intelligible, but as a result of that, that it was intelligible because it had been designed by a rational mind, but they also believed that there was something about nature that actually gave evidence that the universe had been design, designed by a rational mind. And you see this belief in nearly all the early scientists, and it's in the early modern scientists. Here, this is a front piece from an early biologist named John Ray. Um, and he, he's arguing that the wisdom of God is displayed or manifested. He has that uh, 17th century S for F. Uh, uh, is manifested in the works of creation. And this, of course, is a reflection of a biblical concept. Um, you find the same idea in, uh, in Newton, in physics, uh, both in his optics and in uh, the general scolium to the Principia, in the introduction to the Principia, arguably the greatest work of physics ever written. Newton makes very clear what he thinks the theistic implications of his discoveries are. And he makes an elegant, a rhetorically elegant, uh, design argument here. Um, I just want to read the prose. It's wonderful. He says, though these bodies may indeed continue in their orbits by the mere laws of gravity, yet they could by no means have at first derived the regular position of the orbits themselves from those laws. Thus this most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Now, this argument is actually what we would now call a localized fine-tuning argument. It has to do with the fine-tuning of the local solar system, and you will be exposed to a modern version of that later this afternoon from our resident UW astronomer, Guillermo Gonzalez. So this is uh, uh, an argument for design that was built into the Principia and has been resuscitated recently by some discoveries. Now, th this, these Newton and Ray and these people that I'm talking about, uh, are, I'm uh, pointing to... To, to support the idea, something that Whitehead knew, which was that early modern science had this theistic orientation. Theistic presuppositions had given rise to it, and the discoveries of the early scientists seemed to confirm those theistic presuppositions by pointing uh, back to the designer of, of the universe and the life that it contained. Now, uh, this, this idea uh, expressed a... a classical Christian idea that you can find, Judeo-Christian idea that you can find in both the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament, that there's something about nature that displays the handiwork of God, that points to the Creator. And you get this idea in Psalm 19 where it begins, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. You also find this idea in Romans in the New Testament where St. Paul talks about so for the, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. In fact, the front piece of the Ray book is a paraphrase of this biblical concept. Now, um, in the 19th century, this idea began to change, and uh, there is a famous, probably hypocritical story that nevertheless bears repeating, if only because it exemplifies what was the real case. It, it, it exemplifies a shift in the philosophical orientation of, of science during the 19th century. And this is really what Whitehead is reacting to, the rise of what can be called scientific materialism that took place during the 19th century. Now, as the story goes, and this may or may not be historically true, but uh, Pierre Laplace wrote a book called The Celestial Mechanics. That is. Uh, that is historically true. And in the celestial mechanics, he uh, uh, was able to, or he put forward, an explanation for the fine-tuning of the planets and comets, uh, the, the stable orbits that Newton observed. And his explanation was entirely by reference to the laws of nature without uh, any resort to the special design of the creator. Now, uh, uh, apparently, uh, there's this apocryphal story that he was uh, sent the book to Napoleon. Napoleon summoned him to the palace and uh, uh, asked him about the absence of God in his theory. And Laplace was said to have puffed himself up and said, Sire, I have no need of that hypothesis. Um, sorry about the hokey accents. <laughs> My students like them. Uh, 
Okay. Now, as I say, th th there's some dispute about whether or not this actually happened. But what is indisputable is that throughout the 19th century, the diffidence about what you might call the God hypothesis increased among scientists. In fact, to the point where most scientists, by the end of the 19th century, believed that the, the universe could be explained, the universe and the life within it could be explained entirely as the result of the intrinsic properties of nature acting on its own so that a picture of the natural world arose which suggested that nature was eternal and self-existent and indeed self-creating. A, a picture of the world that was not dissimilar to that of the, the naturalism of Aristotle uh, but much more explicitly materialistic. Now, um, this came about, I think, as a result of a number of scientific theories that were specifically focused on questions of origin and which purported to explain the origin of major features that we see around us without reference to the God hypothesis. Um, Laplace's theory is certainly an example of that. It's the, his nebular hypothesis attempted to explain the fine-tuning of the solar system without a designer. Uh, similarly, in biology, uh, Charles Darwin was uh, able to account for the origin of new species, and he did so with a mechanism, natural selection acting on random variation, that purported to function as a designer substitute to play the role that, for example, human breeders might play in selecting for certain traits. And so his, uh, his theory was not only a theory of change over time, but also a theory that purported to explain away the evidence of design and biology. Uh, even in physics, you had an idea that had originally come from the great theist, uh, theistic physicist Newton uh, being turned to support a naturalistic or fully materialistic conclusion. That is the idea that, that time and space are infinite in scope. Newton thought that, that, uh, that time and uh, that space was uh, what he called a divine sensorium, a way by which God um, connected, in a sense, to his creation. And if God was infinite, then space must be infinite. If space must be infinite, then time probably was too. By the late 19th century, most physicists had accepted the infinity of space and time, but accepted it as the grounds for undermining any kind of theistic argument for a first cause. Um, this goes back to Kant, the German philosopher, but the idea was that if, if you could have an infinite regress of physical causes going back without beginning, you would need nothing beyond the universe to cause the universe to come into existence. Uh, Stephen Hawking tells a funny little story to illustrate this idea of an infinite regress. Um, the, uh, there's a, he tells of a young grad, school, uh, uh, grad student who'd gone off to Harvard from a, a small town in Texas uh, where uh, presumably people are ignorant of science. Um, it's terrible bigotry, I suppose, but here it goes. Um, I, I lived, I've lived in Texas. My first job was as a geophysicist with an oil company, and a guy got up who sounded like he was from you know, the hillbilly country, and he started talking in an accent that I, I really could not make out. And, uh, and I was feeling very smug, and he began to write equations on the board so fast my head was spinning. So I quickly was disabused of uh, my, my uh, Northwest bias about accents. But in any case, Hawking tells a story where the, the um, uh, grad student is saying, well, um, explaining to everyone at a church picnic about what he's learned in astronomy and how the, 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 uh, the planets circle in free space around the, the sun with nothing suspending them. It's fascinating. And a uh, little old lady comes up to him and says, well, son, that ain't right. Uh, the earth is suspended by a turtle. It sits on the back of a turtle. And the grad student says, well, but what is underneath the turtle? And she says, well, I can see you're very smart, but it'll do you no good. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> are so much more receptive than my students. Uh, I, I usually, uh, usually I get this deadpan silence, and then you know the only way to get a laugh is to make fun of the fact that the joke wasn't funny. So, um, so anyway, this is the idea of an infinite regress in space. Uh, really, the 19th century concept was that of an infinite regress in time, that you would have material causes going all the way back with no need for a beginning, and therefore no need for a creator. So with Darwin, you eliminate this, this idea. As Fatuma says, Darwin made theological or spiritual explanations of life superfluous. Um, and in physics, you have the same idea. And as a result, 
a worldview arises at the end of the 19th century, which is, uh, was thought to be based on science, and this is a worldview known as scientific materialism or just materialism. And to paraphrase the, the John 9 prologue in the Bible, uh, but to uh, invert the meaning, a, mat a materialist might say, from eternity past were the particles. And the particles became complex living stuff through an undirected process of evolutionary change. And the living stuff eventually, again, through an undirected process, became aware. And the living stuff conceived of God. God is a concept, not as a reality. And so the classical Judeo-Christian understanding of God with the creative capacities that God has as a rational, intelligent, personal agent um, is uh, undermined. God, in the, in the Judeo-Christian worldview, you have a mind first, the mind of God, that brings, speaks matter into existence. Materialism reverses that, and you have matter first, really matter eternally, and then the concept of God arises at the very end of an undirected evolutionary process. Now, this is the worldview that Whitehead encountered in the 1920s. And this is the worldview of scientific materialism. And it's clearly directly contrary to the theistic worldview that Whitehead understood had given rise to modern science. And so he saw this great internal uh, uh, contradiction or tension developing within our Western culture. Now, it's perhaps a great irony of history, but at just that time, during the 1920s, developments in cosmology were beginning to take place that I believe undermine this materialistic worldview and indeed point, um, however gently, towards a theistic worldview. And so I want to now tell the story of that. That is the story of 20th century cosmology. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a lawyer who turned to science, who turned to astronomy, named Edwin Hubble. And Hubble came, uh, his friend said he had a nose for the most interesting problems. And he came up along at just the time in Southern California when they had begun to build these large dome telescopes. Um, he was able to use a 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson. Uh, I have only pictures of the 200-inch. Uh, Guillermo tells me these were just built in 1948, so this is not Hubble's actual telescope. Uh, interest of full disclosure. Uh, but it's a wonderful device, and here's the 200 inch. Okay, now H Hubble began to use these, and these are some of the, his uh, photographs of him in, at his observational station, and he made some remarkable discoveries. And one of the first discoveries that he made was that, uh, that the Milky Way galaxy is not the only galaxy. And these are some of his original um, uh, photographic plates of the, the pictures that he was able to take using this 100-inch telescope. And you can see the beautiful galaxies that he was able to identify as those big new telescopes were able to resolve little pinpricks of light and show that what to our previous observational instruments had been nothing more than pinpricks of light were actually um, galaxies with exquisite structure. This is a spiral nebula here. Another, another take on that. Um, I'm just a little show and tell here. This is a drawing that he made of one of the galaxies to show the, 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 the structure of the spiral nebula. This is one taken with a modern Hubble telescope, uh, and so you get the full color effect. Um, and, um, and this is one of my favorite. We, when we were kids, we used to do these, uh, tack these things to the telephone poles at Fourth of July, and you light them to get the pinwheel. Uh, a firework effect. Well, this is the pin. This is the greatest pinwheel firework ever made. Only the spray of light is on the order of hundreds of millions of light years. Okay, so this is a big. This is a big firecracker here. Okay. Now, um, Hubble made a couple other important discoveries, and that is not only that there were other galaxies, but that in every quadrant of the sky there were other galaxies, and they were present in uh, what, to our thinking at the time, was an enormous density. Um, this is a uh, if you look at a little quadrant of the sky and then resolve it further, you get what is called the Hubble Deep Field. And here we have a beautiful photograph of the deep field uh, showing each of these. You can see the spiral galaxies here. And uh, so this gave Hubble and really everyone who was apprised of these discoveries an amazing sense of awe at the time uh, to think of how immense the universe is. I mean, we have a sense of how big our galaxy is, how far it is to the Andromeda galaxy. Um, one of the near galaxies, but to see that in every quadrant there were galaxies 
in plenty, and they, so many of them were uh, vast distances from us, gave us a new sense of how vast the universe is. Now, from a theoretical point of view, the really important discovery, though, uh, was still to come, and that is that the galaxies that Hubble discovered are moving away from us in every direction. And the way that he was able to determine this was by uh, an observational effect known as redshift, that the light in the electromagnetic spectrum or in the electro or the ultraviolet uh, spectrum is shifted uh, toward the red direction of the spectrum. It's redder than it would otherwise be if the objects were stationary and close to us. And so this is a, I have a, actually come over here. Um, what he, this is one of his original uh, plates, and the galaxies here are listed by distance. So the, the further the galaxies are away, it turns out that the greater is the, the red shift, the shift in toward the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's what this demonstrates. Now, for folks that may not be familiar with red shift, most of uh, uh, you may be familiar with the, the phenomenon of Doppler shift. Um, if you know if a train goes by and recedes from us, the wavelengths of the sound will stretch out and will have a lower pitch to our ear. So you get a hmm kind of effect. Um, uh, to put it at an even more popular level, you might remember Seattleites we might remember the Rainier beer commercials a few years ago. And the Rainiers were riding the motorbikes and going away, uh, receding from us and the, their, their little slogan went, Rainier beer. You know, okay. <laughs> Now, that might have had something to do with the gear shifting on the motor uh, bike, but in, in any case, you're getting the idea. Um, okay, so now this is a fascinating discovery, though, that in every direction of the sky, in every quadrant of the sky, uh, the, the, the galaxies were shifting away, or the, the red, the, they were the, displaying a red shift. They were moving away from us in space. Now, and you can illustrate, then, this concept um, with my first little toy here, um, my, my four-year-old son actually wanted to play with this before I left. You know, I just had to slap his hand and tell, no. Uh, okay. If you think of the, uh, uh, the galaxies presently moving away from us, uh, you can, uh, this underwrites an idea known as the expanding universe because what this suggests is that in the forward direction of time, you have uh, the galaxies moving away, so in every direction, every quadrant, you have expansion. Now, what Hubble actually discovered was that there was a linear relationship between the recessional velocity and the distance that the galaxies are from us. So if a galaxy is far away, it's moving faster. If it's closer, it's moving slower, but still away from us. So the, the, the mathematical relationship is the further, the faster, the further, the faster. Now, the only way to explain this mathematical relationship is by a, a spherical expansion, a, a spherically symmetric expansion, like a balloon, okay? So as you go in the forward direction of time, you get the concept of the expanding universe. The question arises, though, uh, and a very interesting question, what happens when you begin, if you wind this back and go in the reverse direction of time, like the cartoons you see where they back the characters up, okay? What happens in that case is that as you go back further and further in time, both space and the matter within it contract back to a singularity, to a beginning point for the expansion. Um, and so this was the, uh, the discovery that gave rise to what is now called the Big Bang Theory. Um, now this, this discovery, this idea of a beginning to the universe, suggested that the universe was finite the evidence seemed to point to a finite rather than an infinite universe. And remember we said that an infinite universe was one of the foundational uh, beliefs that gave rise to scientific materialism in the 19th century. So this was a very troubling belief to a lot of physicists who had imbibed deeply from this materialistic perspective. One of those was Albert Einstein. Now, this is a very interesting story because Einstein actually anticipated Hubble's discovery. His theory of general relativity, which was a theory of gravitation, um, suggested, or rather it was a, an implication of the mathematics of his theory, that the universe was presently expanding but decelerating. 
It was expanding like a, rather like a firecracker. If you light a fuse on a firecracker, throw it up, it originally bangs and accelerates, and then the shrapnel kind of slows, kind of slows down as it continues to move outward. And Einstein realized that his theory of, that, that general, since general relativity implied an expanding but decelerating universe, that it also implied some kind of bang at the beginning, some kind of initial singularity. Now, this troubled him for explicitly philosophical reasons. He realized that this challenged uh, a kind of reflexive naturalism within the scientific community, which seemed to be altogether sensible. And so he, uh, as often does occur in, uh, uh, well, he, how do we say this? This is hard to say, such a great man, but he fudged his equations, okay? Um, I explain this to my students by, uh, in the following uh, thought experiment. Uh, experiment. It's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The dining hall is about to close. You're testing um, Hooke's Law or something with little hockey pucks on a, um, uh, a vacuum table. And, you're, uh, and you can't get your observations to match the theory that's in your textbook. Uh, what does a good, hungry physics student do? Um, and uh, now I always make clear I never did this. But um, <laughs> we, there's a name for it. It's called dry labbing. And you, I say, do you go to your professor and say, professor, uh, I have, uh, in this short little experiment, uh, overturned some of the major, pillar, major theoretical foundations of modern physics. See, my observations have falsified um, Hooke's law or Newton's theory. Or, uh, no, you don't do that. Uh, you get out your pencil, and I have seen this done. And uh, <laughs> y y the data is uh, brought into greater uh, conformity with the theory. Okay, and then... <laughs> Then you run on to, on to dinner. Now, this is, this is uh, called dry labbing. In a sense, this is what Einstein did. He had a, a meta theory that contradicted his great theory of, of general relativity. He said, this can't be right. It can't be right that there is a beginning point. And so he introduced something called the cosmological constant, which um, in effect showed that the expanding, the, um, the, the force of gravity drawing things together was being countered by a force of expansion that allow the universe to be exactly stable. And he created a picture of a static universe that did not need an initial beginning point and which could have existed in that static state uh, eternally back into the past. Okay? Now, this was a purely ad hoc amendment to his uh, otherwise brilliant uh, theory of general relativity in, in, the, in its mathematical expression. But it was something that was necessary to preserve the idea of an infinite universe. Uh, a few years later, he gets a telegram from, um, from Hubble. And Hubble explains what he has observed. The redshift, the evidence for the expanding universe, and its consequent uh, implication that there was a beginning. Einstein uh, came out from Princeton to California to observe this uh, with Hubble. And this is some, from some famous newsreel footage. Uh, I think this is 1931, 1929, around that time. And Hubble, or Einstein goes in, sees what Hubble sees, and he now comes out and says, um, I now see the necessity of a beginning. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, and it, it, apparently he'd already made up his mind before coming out to California, but it was very dramatic for the media to announce it in this way. And, and he got rid of the cosmological constant. And so... Uh, the Big Bang Theory was born with two pillars, the observational evidence of Edwin Hubble and the theoretical achievement of general relativity, which taken on its face without uh, fudging actually also implied a beginning. Okay. Now, as often happens in science, this wasn't the end of the story. There was a, there's been a complex dialectic back and forth of theories and counter theories. And uh, one of the first reactions to this discovery came from really the very great British astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington, who was, uh, led the team that confirmed Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity. And his reaction to the Big Bang Theory was this. He said, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. I simply do not believe the present order of things started off with a bang. The expanding universe is preposterous. It leaves me cold. Okay. Now, this was a theory known as denial. And um, it's quite popular in psychological circles, but it didn't really net anything in the, the cosmological debate. And I, I say that not to, to make fun of Eddington. Uh, I mean, really, he was a great 
a, a great observational astronomer, but to show instead how deeply embedded the idea of an infinite universe was and how repugnant it was to the sensibilities of scientists at the time. Uh, later, Princeton physicist Robert Dickey explained it this way. He said, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of understanding the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. Now, that's what's at stake here. Now, this is, to me, is a, a, a philosopher of science who loves these questions that are right at the intersection, these meta questions that uh, John Polkinghorne was discussing last night. This, this is fascinating, because this is one of the great questions of uh, great philosophical questions of the ages. Is the universe infinite or finite? Does it require an external cause, or is it self-sufficient? These are great philosophical questions, and we live in a privileged age when these philosophical questions can be addressed meaningfully and helpfully by scientific discoveries. And this is really what this story is about. Okay. Now, uh, there was an attempt, a scientific attempt, in fact a couple, to um, re resuscitate the idea of, a, of the infinite universe. Uh, I mean, scientific as opposed to denial. Okay. And um, uh, Sir Fred Hoyle was uh, one of the uh, chief exponents of a theory of the origin of the universe that came to be known as the steady state uh, theory. Now, this is a very clever uh, cosmology and one which I think illustrates something important about the nature of science, which is that, that oftentimes the same data can be explained by different models or by different theories. And, we, and, uh, and so what Hoyle attempted to do was explain the evidence of the expansion, but do so in a way that preserved the idea of an infinite universe. And I want to just um, demonstrate that with a couple more visual aids. And um, we have only distinguished looking people in the front row. I need some, I need some 18 year old students that can maybe help. Would, would you guys help me out here? Are you SPU students or UW? What? Okay. All right. Um, I've got some tennis balls here. Yeah, you're athletes too. Good. That's helpful. Okay. Now, um, imagine, uh, Hoyle's theory was based on the idea of um, uh, a, 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 just a, pos a posit, a postulation that perhaps the density of the universe should have to remain a constant. Now, density is uh, mass over volume. So the idea of a constant density universe would, would be that we would have an equal number of galaxies in the universe uh, as the expansion continued. So he was conceding the expanding universe, the expansion of space as well as matter into that space. But he said, I, I can explain that and hold on to the idea of an infinite universe. So uh, let you guys be an expanding universe. And if you would go to my right and you to my left, hold up your galaxies for me. Now, at a certain point now, as the, okay, good, we've got, had some expansion. Now, we've, so we've increased our spatial volume, and to remain constant, uh, to retain constant density, we must whoop, uh, we must think, bloop, okay, we need to get some universe, or some more galaxies to pop into existence, okay? And this was, this was, um, that's all, all we need, very helpfully illustrated, thank you. <laughs> uh, so what we need is, we need an expanding, we have the expanding universe, but we need what Hoyle called some continuous creation of matter. And so he posited a, a force, a continuous creation force, that would bring new matter into existence. And this was the name, the, the idea of the steady state universe, that you have, the universe has been uh, here for infinitely long, it's expanding, it's, and uh, so that's no problem, and you have matter being continuously emerging, and, uh, but you have the infinite universe, so you don't need a discrete creation event at the beginning. Now, a lot of people said, look, uh, Hoyle, this is great, but uh, how do you get this matter popping into existence? I mean, that's just, the, uh, you know, that's a violation of the, the first law of thermodynamics, the idea that matter is neither created nor destroyed. And he had a very clever response to this, too. He said, well, that's all right. I mean, the Big Bang advocates have the same problem. Uh, they've got to get all the matter and energy to come into existence at the beginning. Um, I just spread the mystery out, he said. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and in an age of quantum physics, th there was some sympathy towards this kind of approach. Okay. Interestingly, however, it is possible to test. It became possible to test between the Big Bang model and the steady state model. I often ask my students, what do scientists do when they're in a place where the data allow two competing interpretations? The data so far, the data of the expansion, is consistent with both the steady state model and the Big Bang. And what do you do? You look for other evidence that can help adjudicate the conflict, that can discriminate 
the explanatory power of the two models. And this, and um, from the period of 1948 to about 1965, we were really in a, in a position of stalemate. But in 1965, a very interesting um, but unintended observation was made by two, uh, not cosmologists, not theoretical physicists, but uh, practical uh, electrical engineering physicists who were working for Bell Labs. They had a big listening ear behind this listening device. Their names were uh, Arneo Penzis and Robert Wilson. And they were doing some experimental work, and they found that they had a hum in their listening device, and they couldn't get rid of it. And they, tried, they went inside and looked for birds and birds' nests, and they tried to get the power companies to shut the lines off all around them. They did everything they could to eliminate this background noise that they were getting and until one day they realized that it was coming with equal intensity in all directions. It was ubiquitous. And this recalled to one of them one of the predictions that the Big Bang Theory had made, in fact, a prediction of the physicist George Gamow, that if all matter had been condensed at the beginning into what was at that first instant after the singularity, an infinitely hot, dense concentration, then there should be residual radiation from that state that would be emanating throughout the universe as a whole. It would be a little bit like uh, an American Thanksgiving feast where you have the turkey in the oven. And you turn the, t you turn the oven off, and then you open the oven and ask, well, uh, and, and then allow the, the, the heat and the radiation to dissipate throughout the room, what would the temperature of the house be, uh, let's put it this way, would the temperature of the house uh, at some future time be a little bit greater than it would have been otherwise without the turkey in the oven? Um, answer, yes. And what the physicists were envisioning is as space expanded, the initial hot, dense uh, accumulation of matter would be like the turkey in the oven. And as space expanded, that'd be like the oven door opening, and you would have the radiation filling the universe, and it would cause the, um, and, and this radiation would be left over, and it would be detectable, and you can convert radiation to a temperature equivalent, and they were able to make calculations about just what that, the temperature equivalent of that radiation would be 10, uh, 10 billion or 20 billion years after the Big Bang. And that there was an exact number, 2.7 degrees Kelvin temperature equivalent for the radiation. And this, uh, the signature of this radiation that Penzis and Wilson found exactly matched that prediction of the theoretical physicist George Gamow. So a striking confirmation of the Big Bang Theory, and something, of course, that the steady state theory could not explain, because with matter stretching out and popping into existence, it was never congealed to a single place such that it would produce that radiation in the first place. So this is a, a classic example of a piece of evidence that could be explained on one model but was completely inconsistent with another. And by the mid-60s, the uh, steady state theory for this and many other evidential reasons uh, fell by the wayside such that even uh, Hoyle and Bondi and Thomas Gold, the three main exponents of it, uh, each repudiated the theory. One other thing that's very intuitive that might be helpful in understanding uh, counter evidence against the steady state that can be helpful in, in grasping this is uh, the recognition that astronomers in their measurement of galactic ages found that there was not an even distribution of galactic ages going all the way back in time, but rather they were bunched towards the middle age to young uh, range of the spectrum. And this would be consistent with the Big Bang. If matter all originated at a single point in time, it would take a, uh, some time for matter to congeal and to form galaxies. Um, and so you would expect things to be bunched, the ages of galaxies would be bunched towards the middle to youngish end of the spectrum, but nothing near the beginning uh, or all the way back. Uh, with the steady state model, you would expect to have evidence of very old galaxies, and we don't have those. And so this was another really decisive piece of evidence against it. Okay. Now, as often happens in science, um, one failed theory does not destroy a really important idea. So the really f the important uh, the, the failed theory here is the steady state, but the important idea is that the universe is infinite. And there were other cosmologies that came along that attempted to resuscitate the infinite uh, universe, and one was the oscillating universe. Now, these are some cartoon guys, uh, Opus here. Is Opus the little boy or the penguin? I, I was, he's the penguin? Okay, I, my students always have to tell me this. Um, I, he says, I'll try to explain this in terms that the mollusk-like brain of the typical layman can grasp. 
The universe explodes, slowly expands, then gravity draws it together. It collapses and explodes again, a never-ending cycle over and over, forever repeating. Curiously, the idea occurred to Stephen Hawking while watching I Love Lucy. <laughs> and then the opus guy says, I knew it. Okay. Now, this is a cartoon, but it's also the theory. Okay. The oscillating universe idea is something that came along to replace the steady state, and, but it was able to um, preserve the idea of an infinite universe. Because, and again, what does it do? It explains all the same data that is on the table. Now, the expanding universe, the uh, galactic age ranges, uh, the background radiation, but it does it, again, by preserving an infinite universe. So you can illustrate the idea as uh, with, a, with a bouncing ball that the universe, the expansion is the up phase, the recollapse is the down, and you have this kind of infinite uh, bouncing, uh, oscillating back and forth, coll uh, expansion, collapse, expansion, collapse, ad infinitum. And so you get the idea of the infinite universe. Uh, again, um, older Seattleites might remember Stan Borison with his uh, uh, beagle dog and the... Um, uh, accordion instrument, you know, going back and forth. That's kind of the picture of the oscillating universe. All right. Um, okay. Now, so now we have three big, uh, cosmological models: the Big Bang, the steady state, which is was by the 1960s repudiated in the uh, cosmological community, and the oscillating universe. Now, it turns out that the oscillating universe has also run into very severe problems, both evidentially and uh, theoretically. Evidentially, it turns out that the, um, the, the thing that would cause a recollapse is not there, at least in sufficient quantities. Uh, the idea of the oscillating universe is that gravity draws the galaxies back together. So you get this initial expanding uh, expansion, but at some point it just slows down, and gravity then draws matter back to a new, a new collapse. And then you get another expansion, collapse, expansion. Now, it, it is a matter of... Um, observation is to find out, is there enough matter in the universe to cause a recollapse? Big question. Is there enough matter in the universe to cause a recollapse? And estimates on this have kind of bounced around a bit from anywhere from three-tenths to one-tenth to two-tenths, but the most uh, recent evidence of the total amount of matter in the universe, and that would include both the baryonic matter, protons, neutrons, electrons, things of that sort, and the so-called dark matter, is that there is not enough matter. In fact, we have about... Uh, three-tenths of what would be required to cause a recollapse. So there's a very grave uh, observational problem. It's a matter of the empirics here. There's not enough matter to cause a recollapse. Um, and uh, this is, I, actually, I'll let Guillermo explain this uh, later. This is a neat picture. That one, one of the ways we measure dark matter, but I'm going to skip on. We're getting, I need to press on. Okay, so several problems with the oscillating universe idea. Not enough matter to cause a recollapse, but then there are theoretical problems as well. If um, I'm bouncing a ball here, with each cycle, I'm having to impart energy into, into, the, into the bouncing. Okay? What if I allow it to just drop? Uh, it'll damp out and dissipate. Sorry about the kick. And, uh, and eventually, uh, you'll come to a nullifying equilibrium. Now, in the cosmological context, um, it, uh, the, what the physicists say is that, that the energy, not the total energy, energy, but the energy available to do work dissipates, would dissipate with each cycle in an oscillating universe. So you would eventually come to such an equilibrium, and if the universe had been infinitely old, then we would have come to that a long time ago, and since we're not in a nullifying equilibrium, that is heat death, therefore uh, the oscillating universe can't be true. Okay? Now, a related concern is with what's called the mechanical efficiency, or what I call the thermodynamic elasticity. That's my own little term. But, uh, and that's illustrated in this way. Now, you guys better head, do a heads up, because last time I did this at my college, I actually hit somebody uh, with a Super Bowl here. But the, I, the question is, do we have a universe which is, uh, with each bounce, would have the elasticity to bounce back up? Would it have mechanical efficiency to translate that energy of collapse into a re-expansion? Or... Hey, Nice catch. Or do we have one that is more like, golfers will know these things, like this, okay? <laughs> That's low mechanical efficiency, okay? This is high mechanical efficiency, okay? And so um, 
uh, Alan Guth and Mark Shear, two very impressive theoretical physicists, published a paper in 1984 in which they did a really thorough thermodynamic analysis of the mechanical efficiency of the universe and came to the conclusion that uh, we don't have a super ball universe, we have a, a thud ball. And that, and that their paper was titled um, something like, the universe will not bounce, okay? And, uh, and so there's a, this is a very important theoretical uh, consider consideration that counts against the oscillating universe. Finally, there have been recent observations of supernovae which actually suggest that the universe is accelerating in its expansion. And uh, John Polkinghorne mentioned this last night and said we're taking a wait-and-see attitude. I think Guillermo is fairly, well, you can talk about this maybe a bit. But, uh, I think uh, a lot of observational astronomers think there's a lot of merit to this, suggesting that there is a cosmological constant, but it's not one that leaves the universe balanced. Rather, it's one that's causing an acceleration in the stretch. If this is the case, then the oscillating universe is dead. I mean, it's dead anyway, but this, this is another really good nail in the coffin, okay? And um, so this, this, is, this is our, we had um, three cosmological models, two trying to preserve the infinite universe. The last, the first was uh, d challenging that idea and supporting a finite universe, the idea of the Big Bang. And this is where things really stand now, is that the Big Bang theory has become uh, well confirmed within science. And additionally, there was a, really an amazing discovery in theoretical physics. Uh, Father Spitzer, who's on the way here from the airport, calls this a work of immense brilliance in physics. Um, and this was, in 1965, the solution of the field equations, 1968, rather, uh, the solution of Einstein's field equations of general relativity by uh, Hawking, Stephen Hawking, Roger Penrose, and George Ellis, three very prominent um, cosmologists and physicists. And what they were able to do, um, I always tell my students when they see the preceding slide with the equation, I tell, I tell them that'll be on the test. Um, it, so you'll be tested on that too. Uh, what, what, they, um, what they were able to do was show that you solve these equations, very important equations, and it, the, the outcome is this, that the solution to these equations implies that as you go back in time, that the curvature of four-dimensional space-time, the curvature of space, if you will, goes towards an infinite. And as you approach that singular beginning point, you reach an infinite curvature point. Now, to illustrate that, you might imagine looking out over the horizon of the Earth and seeing that you have such a very gentle curvature that you can barely make out that the Earth is curved unless you, you know, do the Columbus thing with the sail coming up over the horizon. So we have a very a gentle, slight curvature. The angle of curvature is very slight. And that corresponds, that circumscribes a large spatial volume. As curvature gets greater and greater, the amount of spatial volume that can be enclosed in a spherical object diminishes to the point where if you have an infinite curvature, that corresponds to no spatial volume. Now, my slide can't quite illustrate that, obviously, so I've got a little circle. There's still some spatial volume there at the singularity. But the, the equations of general relativity imply that as you go back to the beginning, you reach a point where you have a time equals zero singularity and also a space equals zero singularity, a place where there is no spatial volume. Now, let me ask a question. How much matter can be put into zero spatial volume? None. Okay, no thing. And so what you have here, taking general relativity on its face, is a remarkable scientific theory, the implications of which are something like the universe came from nothing into everything uh, at some discrete point in time that you have literally a creation event. There's a kind of consonance here between uh, Einstein's gener theory of general relativity and the old medieval doctrine of creatio ex nihilo. Okay? You literally have um, a, a zero point, a true singularity, where there is neither matter nor time nor space uh, nor energy. Okay. Now, we're going to look at, there's, there's a, another idea about this, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Now, <clears throat> Robert Jastrow, an astronomer, commenting on the evidences that had given rise to the Big Bang and um, in the 1980s said that this is an exceedingly strange development. This was in his book, God and the Astronomers. Um, unexpected by all but the theologians. They have always believed the word of the Bible. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. It is unexpected because science has had such an extraordinary success 
in tracing the chain of cause and effect backward in time. For the scientist, he says, who has lived by the power of uh, his faith and the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians <laughs> who have been sitting there for centuries. Now, this is a, you know, really a remarkable quotation. Jastro himself is religiously agnostic, uh, but obviously an open-minded uh, man who sees that there's something about this theory that is powerfully suggestive of uh, certain aspects of the Judeo-Christian doctrine of creation. And, uh, and so there you have it. Now, um, <clears throat> that's the first part of my talk. Uh, now we're going to get into the, 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 um, the, the part where we're going to discuss some of the philosophical implications of this, uh, these discoveries. Now, despite Jastrow's comment, and, and really I would say that the common sense reaction of many physicists and cosmologists, I, I, would, uh, I had the privilege of hearing Alan Sandage when I was first out of school discussing the Big Bang Theory and explaining it in light of uh, well, he, what he was giving was his first public testimony of his own Christian faith. And part of his explanation of how he had come to faith involved an explanation of the work that he had done confirming um, Hubble's uh, initial observations and the question that was raised by them, which is, you know, how did all this get here? Uh, the great cosmological question. Now, despite this, despite the common sense reaction of many physicists that there is something that seems to be suggestive of uh, of theism or of a Judeo-Christian doctrine of creation, there has also been, I think, what is becoming more and more an orthodox view among many people who have been involved in the science-religion dialogue, and that is that um, the Big Bang Theory does not have theistic implications. And here Christopher Isham, very great uh, theoretical physicist, uh, says a rather naive reaction is to posit a God who performs a creation of the universe, and he means at the beginning, okay? Uh, this is a rather naive reaction to these discoveries that I've just, I've just explained. Now, I, I, uh, maybe I am naive, but I don't see it this way, and I want to explain why. Um, I think, actually, there are theistic implications, though not uh, what used to be called a proof for God's existence. And uh, when you're dealing with empirical evidence, you don't actually get proof. And I think one of the mistakes that people have made in the history of theistic philosophy is try to prove God's existence with a kind of QED certainty that you might expect in mathematics. And so I think there's a middle way here between saying science has no theistic implications, it does not point to God in any way, it's completely neutral about metaphysical questions, and the idea that we can prove things decisively with absolute certainty. I think that these discoveries provide what I call epistemological support or evidential support for theistic belief, even if they don't provide the grounds for a knockdown, drag out, absolutely certain deductive proof of saying. Let me show, show you why. Um, first of all, let's understand why people think this is naive. Firstly, there are two reasons. Um, one, uh, it's often said that the theological doctrine of creation does not require a temporal beginning. Um, and uh, the idea here is that, well, God might be the ground of all being. He might be the reason that there's anything rather than nothing, and that his holding creation in existent moment by moment through time um, is just as much an act of creation as him bringing it into existence at a particular time, or indeed creating time itself. And so this is one understanding of the doctrine of creation, which does not require a temporal beginning, and one um, which therefore suggests that maybe we don't need the Big Bang to underwrite any kind of theistic understanding. Um, a second reason that people think it's naive to draw theistic implications from the Big Bang Theory and from uh, this cosmic singularity is that uh, they hope that natural laws or physical theories may ultimately explain or at least describe the origin of the universe and may even eliminate the singularity that's implied in uh, Einstein's theory. Uh, now, I want to react to the, the, theological, the claim of theological naivete first. And this is, my position is a little different. I would say that a temporal beginning may not be necessary to support theistic belief or a Judeo-Christian doctrine of creation. But if there were a temporal beginning, if there was a temporal beginning, uh, if in fact the universe did begin at a point in time, if there is a singularity, it would nevertheless support theistic belief. That is to say, the fact that you don't need it doesn't mean that it's not helpful if you have it. Okay, so if there, is a, if there is a beginning point, this is going to be something that's very difficult to explain on a naturalistic worldview, but it could be very well explained by a, on a theistic one, and so therefore there may be 
the, the beginning may support a theistic worldview, even if uh, you don't need that piece of evidence to find support for a theistic worldview. Okay. Now, here I, I'm going to give three uh, a, a thumbnail sketch of three different ways in which evidence might support a, a higher belief and show that the evidence for the cosmological singularity supports theism in each of these three ways. Okay. Not you don't get an, an absolute proof, but there is the kind of support that you would expect. That, that evidence always gives to scientific or metaphysical hypotheses. The first is what's called confirmation of hypothesis. In science, we use a method often called hypothetical deductive method, where we posit some hypothesis, and then we spell out the predictions that would follow, what we would expect if the hypothesis were true. We then make some observations and see if those, the evidence that we expect is actually there. If it is, then we say, well, then perhaps our theory is true. So the logic of this is if hypothesis A then evidence B. I see evidence B, therefore, perhaps my hypothesis is true. Now, this is um, formed in a, uh, uh, the, the, the conclusion here has a perhaps to it. It's, it's qualified because scientists are trying to avoid what is a known fallacy of logic, which is that um, illustrated by this fallacy. If it rains, the streets will get wet. The streets are wet, therefore it rained. Okay, now in Seattle, this is always true. Um, <laughs> But it's not always true everywhere else. Um, you might have wet streets, and they might, the wetness might have been caused by a burst fire hydrant, uh, college students throwing water balloons, um, uh, any uh, slight or uh, slight, I mean, sleet, hail, uh, other other sorts of causes might have produced the same the same effect. So we can't say for certain that just because the streets are wet, therefore it rained. Now scientists are well aware of this pitfall. So this is why they often say, we never prove our theories. We merely confirm them. We make predictions. Say, if, if, it's, if it rained, then the streets would be wet. It's rained. Then I can say, at least, then that gives me a reason to think that perhaps it rained. Perhaps my theory is true. So I don't prove it, but I confirm it tentatively. And of course, they're trying to avoid this well-known fallacy in logic called affirming the consequent. Now, so you could do that easily by saying, if it rains, then we would expect the streets to get wet. The streets are wet. Therefore, perhaps it rained. OK, now, what's this got to do with the Big, the big Bang? Uh, and Penzias raises the question, what's the big deal about the Big Bang? Why is it theistically important? And he says, well, this. The best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. Um, now, that's a very, very interesting and provocative statement. But what does he mean? Well, interestingly, this idea of a temporal beginning in the finite universe, uh, while it may not be necessary for various philosophical doctrines of creation, it is, as uh, Peter Hodgson noted in the last hour, something that theologians have understood to have been taught by the Bible from the beginning. Now, at the time of Aquinas, uh, we couldn't, science had nothing to say about this. But it, this is found, uh, the idea that there is a temporal beginning is found throughout both the Hebrew Bible and in the, uh, the Christian New Testament as well. And uh, it's affirmed repeatedly. In the first book of uh, the first uh, uh, verse of the Bible, actually begins with the phrase "in the beginning." Um, you find this in the Christian New Testament as well. Um, epistle to Titus: Faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised. And here's a very curious phrase: from before the beginning of time. Here we have the the idea, the anticipation that time itself is a created entity, which must in some strange sense, begin. You have the same idea in other New Testament epistles, and I won't belabor the point. Now, if we cash this out as a confirmation of a metaphysical, granted, theistic hypothesis, um, we see how the Big Bang Theory can provide the same kind of evidential support that evidence provides to scientific theories um, in the following way. We can say, if theism or the Judeo-Christian view of creation are true, then we have reason to expect evidence of a finite universe. We have evidence of a finite universe. Therefore, we have reason to think that theism in the Judeo-Christian view of creation may be true. Okay? Our hypothesis uh, of theism in a Judeo-Christian view of creation have been confirmed by evidence of the Big Bang. Not proven, but confirmed in the same way that evidence confirms scientific theories. Now, of course, you have the same kind of logical problem in that you may have many different theories that could explain the same evidence. and so. The confirmation of hypothesis is always a weak form of evidential support, but it is evidential support nonetheless. It's support for belief. Now, a better situation happens when you can provide, you can show that the main competing hypotheses are incapable of 
explaining the same evidence. And this is the situation I think we do have with the Big Bang. And this is a mode of inference known as inferring to the best explanation. And this is a stronger form of evidential support for a theory, whether a scientific theory or a metaphysical hypothesis. And I think this is what we have in the case of the Big Bang, singularity. This, this method of reasoning says, look, there are many possible causes that might account for a single effect or event. Um, in the best case, we can eliminate some or all of them, thus leaving only one or a few possible causes as a best or better explanation. Now, this is what I think is going on with the Big Bang singularity. If there's a true singularity at the beginning. Uh, uh, there are the, the, of the main worldviews. Theism can explain that best. If you think of uh, the, the great worldviews in, in philosophy, you think of pantheism, uh, the idea that God and matter are coextensive, bound together, that God is connected to matter and God is impersonal. You think of, of course, theism, which is that God brought matter into existence and transcends matter, space, time, and energy. And you also think of materialism or naturalism that denies any, the existence of any kind of God and says that matter and energy are self-existent, self-creating, and indeed eternal. Now, uh, clearly, pantheism and naturalism have a very difficult time explaining this singular beginning. Uh, if you think of pantheism, you might ask, well, could the god of pantheism explain the origin of matter, space, time, and energy itself? Well, if you go back to that, singular, that singularity event, there is no pantheistic god because there is no matter for the pantheistic god to be coextensive with. That is to say, god is matter, and matter is god in pantheism. If there's no matter, there is no god, and therefore a god of that sort has no causal efficacy or no causal powers to produce a universe literally from no matter, okay? Now, similarly, materialism has the same kind of problem. Guth says the instant of creation means, remains unexplained. We have, the first, we have evidence of a first effect, but we do not know its first cause. Hawking says the actual point of creation lies outside the scope of presently known physics. He's got a little thing he wants to try to solve the problem, uh, but uh, it's the same idea, that it, the Big Bang is not a causal theory. Okay, so with that in mind, then, the profile of the kind of cause that you would need to account for the origin of the universe from a zero point is a cause that transcends matter, space, time, and energy. And of the great worldviews that I've looked at, theism, naturalism, and pantheism, only theism uh, affirms the existence of such an entity, a god that uh, revealed himself at the bur burning bush by saying, I am that I am, a timeless entity who transcends matter, space, time, and energy, and who has immense causal powers. Okay, and so some very sophisticated physicists who are also theologically literate, like Charlie Towns, have uh, said, contrary to Chris Isham, um, my view of the question of the origin, uh, the origin of the universe seems, uh, uh, the question of the origin of the universe seems always left unanswered if we explore it from a scientific point of view alone. Thus, I believe there is a need for some religious or metaphysical explanation, some entity that transcends matter, space, time, and energy. Thus, he says, I believe in the concept of God and his existence. Okay, so logically what we have here is an inference to the best metaphysical hypothesis, oop, not quite the best, the, a better hypothesis to theism. I would have to acknowledge here that deism also could account for this evidence, and if you're interested in how I would uh, adjudicate the argument between deism and theism, you might come to University Presbyterian Church tomorrow. I'm teaching a Sunday school class on evidence of design and biology, which would support evidence for theism, but not, would provide evidence for theism, but not for deism. Okay. In any case, I think that's all you can get from the cosmological argument. Okay, finally, there is a deductive form of this argument. Uh, this is known as the Callum cosmological argument. It goes like this. Everything that begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe must have a cause which is separate from itself. This is a deductive form. I don't think you can get an absolute deductive proof out of this because you can make arguments about each of the premises. We don't have absolute certainty. It's very difficult to get absolute certainty about any scientifically grounded argument. But nevertheless, I think you can get a strong deductive argument that has what philosophers call probabilistic force. And that would then be a third um, sense in which you have epistemological support uh, from, from the Big Bang singularity. Now, uh, in closing, I need to acknowledge one objection. And I hope we can deal with this in the Q&A time. And that is that um, there is a field of endeavor known as quantum cosmology that wants to uh, suggest that inside the very smallest little minute period of time called Planck time, that the physics of the universe was very weird and describable by quantum theory. 
And for that reason, we can't make deterministic back extrapolations all the way back to the very beginning. Okay? And therefore, we can't be absolutely certain that, uh, that Einstein's theory of general relativity and the solution to his field equations that imply an absolute zero point uh, uh, can take us all the way back to that zero point. So inside that tiny little window of time, we may have a different kind of physics. And this is the idea of quantum cosmology. Uh, interestingly, though, and I'd be happy to address this in the question time, I think even if you take this route, while you get around the kinds of theistic implications for the Big Bang theory and gen for, uh, from the Big Bang theory and general relativity that I just sketched, you end up um, resuscitating other kinds of theistic arguments such that there becomes nowhere to hide. I call this the cosmological trilemma for naturalism. That if you embrace the, the, the singularity of general relativity, you end up with various kinds of strong theistic arguments. If you go with quantum cosmology, you, get, you can get around certain kinds of theistic arguments, but only at the cost of reviving others. And I'd be happy to discuss that in the Q&A. But I'd, I'd like to now have some time for precisely that.